All right, uh, it's 1010 or 1011. We're gonna get started with part two of our lecture for today. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Smith um, from the Scott Department of Urology at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, he's gonna be talking to us about principles and practices uh, of management for neurogenic bladder. So welcome Dr. Smith and uh, take it away, thank you. Thanks Carissa and uh, thanks for allowing me to participate in this uh, lecture series. It's uh, real informal, so I, I want questions. If you guys have them, you can send them to Carissa and she'll collate them and we'll go over them at the end. And if you, you have trouble hearing me, then you can, you know, let Carissa know and she'll try to stop me and have me move, you know, closer to the microphone if, if needed. But I have no financial complex or disclosures to talk about. The, the objectives of this talk are really to be able to classify neurogenic bladder using really the classification systems that I find most useful. We're going to talk about the normal phys physiology of voiding and what happens after pathology such as spinal cord injury. We'll talk about the uh, proper way to really do a history and physical on these patients and what diagnostic tests are really useful and needed to appropriately evaluate and treat these patients. We'll go briefly into some management techniques and then we'll, we're really going to focus on a couple of neurogenic bat bladder pathologies that are most common that you're going to see most often within the clinic, spinal cord injury, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis. Neurogenic bladder, the, the definition is really dysfunction of the bladder resulting from disease of the central nervous system or peripheral nerves that control micturition. And that's important because a lot of times if you're in clinic and it, you, know, you get a referral from another urologist, they may send a patient with a suprapubic tube who can't void, they may be in urinary, urinary retention, with a diagnosis of neurogenic bladder. You just have to be aware that to really classify a patient with having neurogenic bladder, there has to be a, a, a neurologic etiology or what, what's thought of as a neurologic etiology for their voiding dysfunction. And that there's different ways to classify it. I think that the, the number, the second one, the ICS or International Continent Society classification system is the best for actually evaluating and diagnosing patients. This is a a eurodynamic, eurodynamic based definition where both the bladder and the sphincter are evaluated individually. It also gives information on the bladder sensation as well and storage pressures or compliance. So that's very useful for the diagnostic, diagnosis or evaluation of patients with neurogenic bladder. And then I think the functional classification that was really proposed by Dr. Alan Ween is very useful for the management phase of treating these patients because it divides the, the bladder, the urinary tract dysfunction into two phases, disorders of storage and disorders of emptying. And both these pathologies can be due to the bladder and or the outlet. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about management options. There are, as you said, various etiologies for neurogenic bladder. It has to be a, a, some kind of neurologic sequelae. But the ones we're going to focus on mainly are spinal cord injury, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis. When you think of the, the lower urinary tract, it really has two functions. 99.9% .9 of the time, your bladder is in a, in, in a storage mode. So you're sitting here, you're listening to the lecture, your bladder's filling with urine, and it should fill at low pressures. And that has to do with the viscoelastic properties of the bladder wall, as well as actual active relaxation of the bladder wall, uh, the smooth muscle, which is controlled by the sympathetic system. So the bladder wants to fill, it wants to be like an elastic balloon fill at low pressures. It also has to have adequate sphincter mechanism so that it maintains continence. You don't want the bladder just to be leaking urine at rest. So it has to fill at low pressures. It has to have functional sphincters that maintain continence. And you have to have some sensation. You wanna know when your bladder is full or when, when it, it's uh, time to go look for a restroom and go void. And then the second phase, or the second function of the lower urinary tract is emptying. And that requires a bladder muscle that can contract and that can contract sufficiently and for, strong, for a long enough period of time that it can void efficiently into completion. It also requires sphincters that can be, uh, it requires coordination between the bladder and the sphincters so that when the bladder is contracting, the sphincters relax and you have efficient voiding occurring. And you want a competent, ureter vesicle junction so you don't have reflux. So these are the, the functions of your urinary tract. And you can think of it as a simple switch where you're, you're for the most, most 
time you're in the storage mode. And then when it's safe and socially appropriate, you go to the restroom, it's like you flip a switch and you go into the uh, elimination mode where the bladder contracts, the sphincters relax, and then the switch gets flipped back to the storage mode. And that's a simplistic way of looking at it. Obviously, it's more complex than that. The bladder is unique compared to other autonomic organs like the GI system in that it really requires central nervous system input to maintain its function. If you cut that, if you cut the CNS input, the bladder is going to go into what we call initially like a spinal shock phase where it's underactive or areflexic. It doesn't work, doesn't contract. And that's different than G GI system. You can do a vagotomy and the GI, the, the intestines will still peristalsis. They have an intrinsic innervation that allows them still to function even with the innervation. The bladder is different. The bladder also is innervated by both autonomic and somatic pathways. Autonomic, it has the parasympathetic pathway, which comes out through the sacral cord and in innervates the bladder through the pelvic nerve. This is the primary motor control of the bladder. So this is active during the, the emptying phase. That's when they, the, uh, the uh, pelvic or parasympathetic nerves re release acetylcholine, which acts on muscarinic receptors to induce bladder contraction. Now, the sympathetic system counteracts the parasympathetic system. So this uh, actually is active during bladder filling, and it has two primary areas where it innervates. It innervates the bladder body through beta adrenergic receptors, and these receptors, uh, the, the sympathetic nerves release uh, norepinephrine, and this activates the beta adrenergic receptors to promote bladder relaxation during filling. So this is active during filling. It also has nerves that innervate the bladder neck, and it also releases norepinephrine, but in this case, it acts on alpha adrenergic receptors, which actually cause increase in smooth muscle contraction. So this is the internal urethral sphincter that is active during filling. So the sympathetic system is active during filling, and the pelvic nerve is active during emptying. And then you have the somatic pathways through the pudendal nerve. This is also through the sacral cord, and this is active during filling as well. This innervates the external urethral, the, the striated muscle, uh, by releasing acetylcholine, it activates nicotinic uh, receptors, and this is active during filling too. So basically, the sympathetic and the somatic are active during filling to promote uh, bladder uh, filling at low pressures and maintain continence. And then the pelvic nerves or parasympathetic nerves are active during emptying, and then the, the other systems are turned off. So how is this all coordinated? Well, the, the next slide will go about to talk about that. Sensa sensation from the bladder is sent through the spinal cord up through the spinothalamic tracts to an area in, in the brain stem called the periaqueductal gray. And what, what this area does is it processes all the sensory information coming from the bladder as well as from other cortical areas uh, that are uh, conveying uh, things like emotion and uh, anxiety, other things that may affect bladder function. What the periaqueductal gray does is it, it has these inhibitory pathways on the pontine micturition center. So it's like a governor or brake that blocks this reflex voiding from occurring until it's safe and socially appropriate. Whenever, it, whenever, that, whenever uh, that you, you reach that point where you get to the restroom and, you, and, you, and it's safe and socially appropriate to void, basically you'll release that inhibition and you'll allow the pontine micturition center to initiate the reflex. And what the pontine micturition center does is it coordinates the, these different pathways. So it activates the bladder to contract and it inhibits the sphincter mechanisms to allow efficient voiding to occur. And then once you're, you're done emptying completely, it, it will inhibit the pelvic nerve or, or contraction of the bladder and it'll activate these sphincter mechanisms. So the pontine micturition center can be, I, I kind of think of it as the grand central station. It really coordinates function between the, the bladder and the sphincter, but it is tonically inhibited by a braking system or a governor from the periaqueductal gray. So that tonic inhibition is what allows you to be toilet trained and allows you to have what we call a social, you know, being, being able to um, have social voting patterns where you void when it's appropriate and safe. And we'll talk later about what happens with pathology and how these pathways are disrupted. But the, the next thing I want to talk about is that the sensation or this reflex is really triggered from the bladder lining itself. That it was, in the past, it was thought that the urethelium or, or the uh, lining of the bladder was just a waterproof layer just to prevent the toxins from the urine 
from getting in and irritating the bladder. It's actually been found to be the most metabolically active layer within the bladder itself. These receptors respond to stretch. They have, I mean, these uh, cells respond to stretch. They have receptors that can uh, receive transmitters and they can release various mediators like ATP and nitric oxide, which are thought to actually activate underlying tissues and start the micturition reflex itself. And one of these cells are these interstitial cells of K. Hall. These are cells that have a, a dual function. They're thought to kind of transmit information from the urothelium to other tissues like the afferent or sensory nerves. It will then transmit that signal up the spinal cord, up into the brain, as well as activate smooth muscle itself. So these are thought to be kind of relay cells that may, they, that may be an interface between the bladder lining and the uh, surrounding nerves and smooth muscle. So if you look at normal voiding, what happens with normal voiding? This is a picture on the left. Normal sensation is, is, is transmitted through these A-delta myelinated bladder afferents. It goes into the sacral cord. It's sent up through the spinothalamic tract into the brainstem to the periaqueductal gray. Like we said before, uh, when, the, when the bladder fills, you'll have some sensation of filling, but the bladder is not contracting. It's not until it's safe and socially appropriate that you'll actually inhibit these inhibitory pathways. So it's like you're releasing a break, the periaqueductal gray, release a break, and then it'll allow the PMC or pine team McPherson center to activate that reflex. The bladder will contract, the sphincters relax, you'll empty efficiently, and then it goes back to that storage mode. So this is just a CMG or urodynamic tracing showing what happens with bladder filling, and this is an EMG. So the bladder fills, this is the volume on the x-axis and the pressure on the y-axis. You can see it fills and maintains low pressure. This is the compliance we're talking about. That the bladder is actually relaxing or maintaining low pressure with filling. This is due to the viscoelastic properties of the bladder and also due to their actual smooth muscle relaxation. It fills to a certain volume when it's safe and socially appropriate to void. Then the sphincter relax, the bladder contracts, and then it goes back to storage mode. This is the EMG measuring the sphincter tracing. You can see that sphincter EMG gets increased with filling. This is a normal reflex called the guarding reflex to help prevent leakage during filling as the bladder gets fuller. So what happens with spinal cord injury? Well, obviously there's an injury within the spinal cord itself that causes a cytotoxic damage, but we've also found there's, there's changes within the, the target or the, the distant organ itself, like the bladder. What happens in the bladder where animal studies have shown that there's released, a large release of these neurotrophic nerve growth factors that can be taken up into sensory pathways within the bladder, transmitted to the sacral cord and cause a lot of plasticity within that environment, a lot of growth of new connections and new synapses. So what happens with spinal cord injury is Sensation is not transmitted by the A-delta myelinated fibers, but there's an unmasking of these C-fibers, these unmyelinated fibers that are normally only active with uh, like infections, noxious stimuli. So if you had a UTI, these receptors would become active to cause bladder overactivity is a natural defense mechanism to try to rid yourself of, the, of this infection. But in this case, they're becoming active with pressure or volume stimuli. So now the, the, this uh, nerves are activated. They send their information into the sacral cord. Because the spine has been damaged, you have no, uh, no way of transmitting that information up to the, to the brainstem and having coordination uh, being taken place by the Pontine Micturition Center. Actually, these new synapses develop between the afferent nerves and interneurons, as well as some of the pelvic nerves and even pedendal nerves innervating the sphincter. And they, call this, they cause this local reflex circuit to develop. And so you get these kind of uninhibited or overactive bladder contractions that we see during urodynamics. But at the same time, because you don't have coordination from the pontine micturition center, you, see, you can see this dysenergic pattern develop where not only is the bladder activated, but the sphincter is activated at the same time. And so you have this obstructive voiding pattern where the bladder and sphincters can contract this dysenergic or discoordinated pattern. And this can lead to obstructive voiding patterns it can lead to pressure building up within the bladder and can even back up to the kidneys and cause problems for patients. So that's why it's really important that we do these studies to evaluate what's going on. But this is what's thought to be happen with the pathology with spinal cord injury. So if you look at this schematic talking about showing the different pathways, and one thing I'll say is the sympathetic nerves come out through a, a higher level within the spinal cord, usually T11 
to L2, whereas the, the detrusor nucleus of the parasympathetic nerves and the somatic nerves that innervate the sphincter come out through the distal sacral cord. So if the pontine micturition center is kind of the grand central station, this is the one that coordinates bladder and sphincter function, and you uh, and the paraqueductal gray is kind of uh, placing this tonic inhibition on the pontine micturition center. It's actually blocking this reflex. If there's any pathology within, within the brain, often what happens is you've lost that inhibitory control on that reflex. And so you develop this kind of reflex voting pattern. So patients that have, you know, a stroke or a, a brain trauma or maybe a brain tumor, often the times they'll develop what we call uh, like an overactive bladder or, or where they'll have this uninhibited bladder contractions. It'll be coordinated because the PMC is still intact. So the bladder contract, the sphincter is relaxed, but it's overactive. They don't have this uh, social or conscious control over voiding. Now you can imagine if you have an injury within the spinal cord, above the sacrum but below the pons, now you can develop the overactive bladder because of these local reflex loops that develop, but you can also have dysenergic voiding because you've lost coordination from the pontine micturition center. So detrusor sphincter dysenergia is really only going to develop from a suprasacral but uh, subpons injury where you lose that regulation from the pons. And finally, if you have a lower cord injury through the sacral cord or peripheral nerves, the predominant pattern you see is is an underactive bladder, or detrusor underactivity, or areflexia, where the bladder fills it, it usually low pressures, but it can't empty because you've lost the motor control. So I think we're going to start with this first question. This is a 48-year-old male with a two-week history of lower back pain and difficulty voiding. A physical exam shows an absent bulbocavernosis reflex and loss of perineal sensation. An MRI of the spine that shows an L4 L5 disc protrusion. So the most likely Distribution of his neural injury is, and if you guys can just, you have about 20 seconds, you can pick one of these answers. This is from the, one of the uh, older SESP questions. So if you can just take your time and, and see what you think on that, we'll go over that. All right, let's see what you guys chose. All right, so it looks like most, 62% said uh, D, and we'll go to the answer, and that's, uh, I'm going to move this out of the way, that, that's correct. So this is a, uh, this uh, patient had symptoms of what we call cauda equina syndrome, which uh, can occur with uh, disc disease, usually a, a central protrusion, and it can affect uh, these nerves coming out that control bladder and sphincter function. So we talked about these nerves, the pedental nerve and parasympathetic, come out to that level. So you can have usually a, a areflexic or underactive bladder. And if the denervation of the sphincter is severe enough, they can have urinary incontinence as well as even fecal incontinence. So that's something to watch about if you see a patient come in with usually lower extremity weakness and they have some bowel or bladder incontinence, they could have a, a called equina syndrome. So we'll go to the next slide now. Let me see if I can advance that in here. Okay, so uh, evaluation and, and diagnosis. The uh, most important goal with evaluating these patients, especially spinal cord injury patients that really are at high risk for upper tract damage, is protect the upper tracts. We're really trying to protect the kidneys first. We're trying to prevent comorbidities like urinary, urinary tract infection, stone formation, and then you know give the patient a treatment option that can help them achieve and help them achieve continence and really improve their quality of life. So it's it's important to start with a, a good history. You want to know what type of neurologic disease is resulting in the neurogenic bladder. Is it a spinal cord injury or is it something else? Multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, a stroke. If the spinal cord injury, you want to know, you know, what's the level of the injury? Is it a complete or incomplete? And do they have, is there any risk or do they have any symptoms of autonomic dysreflexia? And we'll talk about that a little later on. It's important to know how they're currently managing their bladder. Are they voting on their own using a catheter, a condom catheter? And what's their degree of continence or incontinence? How, how severe is it? How many pads are they using? Any history of uh, infrequency of urinary tract infections? Are they febrile UTIs or just, you know, local uh, or just symptomatic UTIs? Any history of stones, uh, their sexual function, any uh, interest in fertility? And what's their bowel program? Because this can clearly impact their uh, bladder function as well. Their exam, you really want to focus uh, the exam on the you know, abdomen, back, and spine exam, 
you want to do a, a, a genital pelvic exam as well as a rectal exam and, 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 uh, and a focused neurologic exam. You want to look for things like skin breakdown that could be resulting or contributed to by urine leakage and any evidence of urethral erosion as well from uh, chronic catheterization. The labs, you we really want to focus on a UAE culture, but know the difference between true UTIs and colonization. That's an important factor to know. And then, you know, doing some chemistries, electrolytes, creatinine. In spinal cord injured patients, the cystatin C is a better measure because it's not dependent on muscle mass. And then in males, getting a PSA exam. Radiologic exam is really important to evaluate the upper tracts. We usually will start with a renal ultrasound because less radiation exposure, and that's a good way to monitor for any evidence of uh, back pressure from the bladder causing hydronephrosis or other complications such as stone formation. This is an old slide just showing distribution of neurologic injury. And it in this example, you see a pretty fair distribu distribution from cervical through thoracic, lumbar, and even lower quarter sacral injuries. And what the point of this slide is that normally you'd expect, like that when we went through that, that schematic of the different pathways, that a patient with a lower cord injury, like a sacral injury, would most likely have what we used to call detrusor abreflexia, or what we now call neurogenic detrusor underactivity. And that's what we see here. And you'd also expect the higher the level of injury, the more likely you're going to have the detrusor sphincter dysynergia. And likewise, we see that. But you can also see that there are patients with cervical, that classify with a cervical injury by their age of score, that have the areflexia or underactivity, as well as patients with a sacral injury that can have dysynergia. And the point of this is that the physical exam doesn't always show what's truly occurring with, with the bladder. There may be, in the case of a patient with a cervical injury, they may have an occult lesion in their sacrum that's not picked up by exam, but that knocks out the bladder pathways. The same way a patient with a sacral injury may have an incomplete injury where some information is being transmitted, but yet it, it can't be coordinated at the PMC, so they have a dyssynergic voiding. So urodynamics are really important because uh, the level and completeness of spinal cord injury don't always predict what we find on urodynamics. It allows you to really individualize the bladder and sphincter activity so you can really develop a, a treatment plan that's going to be uh, safe for the patient and really improve their quality of life. Some of the things that we look at on urodynamics are sensation. This is the filling phase. Do you have any sensation of filling? What is there any evidence of overactivity during filling? And then really, what's their compliance, which is uh, a measure of the, the bladder stiffness, right? You can measure compliance by taking a change in the volume and dividing it by change in pressure. Usually, anything above 20 ml per centimeter of water is considered normal. Between 10 and 20 is considered decreased, and below 10 is really poor. Another way we test we can do is what we call detrusor leak point pressure. And this is where we fill the bladder during a urodynamic test. And the, uh, the volume, uh, the, uh, the pressure at which we see leakage occurring around the catheter is what their detrusor leak point pressure is. Now, this is actually leakage occurring outside of a bladder contraction. So it's just related to the stiffness of the bladder. So a higher leak point is usually consistent with a decreased compliance, right? So the two general patterns we see when we do urodynamics are either neurogenic detrusor underactivity, what we used to call areflexia, and they may or may not have adequate compliance. And the other one is neurogenic detrusor overactivity, or what we used to call hyperreflexia, and they uh, may or may not have detrusor sphincter dysynergia, and may or may not have uh, adequate compliance. They may have good or poor compliance. As far as cystoscopy, it's, uh, there's no uh, stringent, you know, really guidelines on this. Some recommend doing a surveillance cystoscopy on patients that have had chronic indwelling catheters for over five to 10 years. I think it's clear that if patients are having recurrent urinary tract infections or any, you know, hematuria, gross hematuria, that we don't want to just attribute it to, to, to uh, catheter, you know, irritation or damage, but you want to do a cysto on these patients as well. So what happens after spinal cord injury? Initially, there's a spinal shock phase where the bladder is, is, is flaccid. You have an abreflexic or underactive bladder. You also have flaccid paralysis you know, below the level of injury. And then you have a recovery pattern. Usually, the somatic reflexes recover first. So the patient will develop you know, uh, reflex spasticity in the lower extremities. And then the bladder function will return. And then you usually have a, a stable pattern. So we don't normally 
perform your dynamics right away when they're in the spinal shock phase because you're going to just see a, a reflexic or underactive detrusor. These patients are usually managed with just intermittent catheterization, or if that can't be done, an indwelling catheter. Once they start developing these somatic reflexes, or if they start leaking between catheterizations, that's a sign of these bladder reflexes returning, and that's a good time to do a baseline urodynamic study. We talked about detrusor leak point pressure. This is just a schematic showing that, that, that it's the pressure at which you see leakage occurring around the catheter during filling, and you can you know the volume of infusion as well as the pressure which that occurs. Normally, we want that to be less than 40 centimeters. Above 40 centimeters has been shown to lead uh, to be correlated or associated with upper tract damage, hydronephrosis, reflux, and, and renal impairment. This is a patient example of a patient that uh, was catheterizing and getting volumes of between 200 and 250 mLs. They said that they had you know some leakage between catheterizations, but otherwise they thought they were doing well. We did a urodynamic study and calculated leak point pressure. You can see they don't actually have a leak until they reach 63 centimeters at a volume of 225 mLs. But you can also see they reached this danger zone at a, a, a 40 centimeters at a volume of only 125 mLs. So for probably half the time that the bladder's filling, they're putting their kidneys at risk and they don't realize that. So that's why the urodynamics are really important. You can actually find a patient and, and document that they're in this danger zone and, and then use treatments to try to uh, either shift that curve to the right or reduce their leak point pressure. Autonomic dysreflexia is something we gotta talk about and be concerned about because uh, this is, could be a, a really deadly condition. It's usually found in patients with a spinal cord injury of T6 or above, above the level of the sympathetic outflow, and it's triggered by a sensory stimulus below the level of injury. So in, in, in case of urology, if you're doing a cystoscopy or if you're doing a urodynamic test and you're filling the bladder, this sensory stimulus could trigger an unregulated sympathetic uh, release where they have severe malignant hypertension, they can develop a reflex bradycardia, it can lead to a you know, stroke, patients can die from this. So it's, it's a severe condition. You wanna screen patients if they have an injury of T6 or above, if they, if they are prone to autonomic dysreflexia, they have it. And if you're gonna do a testing, you may have to pretreat patients. You definitely need to monitor blood pressure during any procedure. And if they start having symptoms, then you wanna you want to drain the bladder, remove the stimulus, you wanna loosen their clothing, sit them up. And then if you have to treat, you can use some vasoactive agents such as uh, nitro paste to bring down the blood pressure. Some, it's a really important and, be, and to be aware about. As far as management, we talked about the, 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 the different ways to classify. I think this failure to store and failure to empty is really a useful way when you talk about management. And a failure to store can be a bladder cause or a outlet cause. A bladder cause is usually due to a bladder overactivity, a true overactivity, or poor compliance. If the bladder is too stiff, it may just uh, push the urine out and uh, you may have leakage from that as well. So treatments, you know, really depends on underlying condition, if they're a complete spinal cord injury, you know, I mean, you can still do some behavioral treatments, fluid management, um, but it's going to be hard to do things like bladder retraining and, and things like that. If it's, uh, you know, someone else, a different condition with a neurogenic component, then these things can work. But fluid management, uh, bowel management are very important. Medication adjustments can help. If patients have poor mobility, then you can do things to, to help them. They may have incontinence because they can't get to the bathroom in time. Uh, and so giving them a bedside commode or a urinal by the bed can help. There's pharmacologic interventions. The, the common things we use are the antimuscarinics that can uh, block the muscarinic receptor and work on the par parasympathetic pathway. And then the beta adrenergic agonist medicines are also useful. They can actually work on the sympathetic pathways to promote bladder relaxation during filling. If the medicines fail, we usually go to third line agents and these can be either the, the Botox injection or sacral neuromodulation or the uh, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. In general, usually for the spinal cord injuries, I would say that the, uh, the uh, botulinum toxin, the Botox injections are what we go to first because we don't usually offer the, the sacral neuromodulation in these patients or even the PTNS. If these things fail, then you, you can consider a surgical treatment. And these, there's a variety of different surgery. We'll touch on them briefly, but you can do something as, as uh, like augmentation cystoplasty where you use a piece of intestine and enlarge the bladder where they'll still catheterize from below. You can do an incontinent diversion 
like an iliovesicostomy or ileal conduit, or you can do a continent diversion. This is an example of a patient that had a chronic catheter, and you can see this tracing on top. You can see they had a very poor compliant bladder. This isn't a bladder contraction, but poor compliance. It's very stiff from just having that chronic irritant catheter. They reach a pressure of about 50 centimeters in a volume of only 180 ml. So very poor compliant bladder. Just by teaching this patient intermittent catheterization, getting that chronic nidus or foreign body out of the bladder, that shifted the curve downward. So now they're only reaching a pressure of 20 centimeters at a capacity of over 400. So that really improved their compliance with just intermittent catheterization. And that intermittent catheterization really revolutionized the treatment of spinal condition patients because it, it took away renal, and fa renal failure or impairment or complications from, from, uh, from the bladder, uh, the kidneys is the primary cause of death. And uh, the, the important thing is you just want to make sure if you're going to put them on an intermittent catheterization program that, they're, that they have good storage pressures, that they're not storing at high pressures. So you may have to also add medication for that. This is another example of a patient with very poor compliance. You can see the pressures are rising almost equal to the increase in volume. Their safe capacity, they reach this uh, 40 centimeter pressure at only 175 ml. So this patient, if you, they were catheterizing, they have to catheterize so often because they'd have to keep their volumes below 175 mLs. They don't leak until they reach a pressure of 59 cent centimeters. So you put this patient on medicine and it shifts the curve downward. They still have poor compliance, but now their safe bladder capacity is 375 mLs. We didn't do anything to the leak point pressure. We just shifted the curve down. So now they don't reach that 40 centimeters until they're at a higher volume. So you allow this patient to you know, not have to catheterize so often just by putting them on medication. Here's the next question here. So a 15-year-old paraplegic athlete has qualified for the Paralympics. Her overactive neurogenic bladder has been well controlled with oxybutynin, 10 milligrams twice a day. She's recently become intolerant of the medication due to severe heat intolerance induced with the training. Without the antimuscular medication, she has severe incontinence. So with the Olympics only seven weeks away, what would you recommend for this patient? And here's your choices. <clears throat> so it's a, either intravascular insulation of oxybutynin, intravascular insulation of uh, ricinifer toxin, intravascular injection of botulinum toxin A, placement of a sacral nerve stimulator or transcutaneous neuromodulation. So let's see how you guys answered that. All right, intravesical injection of botulinum toxin. Okay, that's right. Yep. So that's the uh, so that, that heat intolerance can be seen in these patients. Less common with the slow slow re release, but the next the next step for this patient would be the Botox injections. That's correct. And that's how we do it. We can do it in the office. We can if a patient's voiding on their own, we use a use a lower dose, 100 units. If they're catheterizing, we use a higher dose. after injection. And then, you know, if the Botox fails or if the patient is tired of having to come in, you know, for these injections, even if, is, even if they're infrequent, we can do a, a reconstructive. We, and urodynamics are really important to really look at their baseline bladder function. And then you really want to look at, you know, what's their disease type? Is there any possibility of progression? What's the important factor? Is their dexterity? Are they going to be able to catheterize? What's their reliability? What's, do they have a good social support system? You don't want to do an augmentation or on a patient and they're not going to be compliant with catheterization because they could rupture it and, and die, right? So it's really important. And, and what is their real desire? Some patients might not really require a, a cotton diversion. They, they don't mind having an incontinent diversion. And are there are other skin, skin issues that, are, that can affect what you're going to do for that patient. So if you do an augmentation, we usually use ileum or, or colon. You want to be aware of the, elect the electrolytic abnormalities, which most commonly for this is the hyperkaloremic, hypokalemic metabolic acidosis. Uh, 
it really, a lot of it, that what you do depends on surgeon preference and, and patient considerations. And then long-term things to think about are, you know, how compliant are they going to be with catheterization? There are risk factors with stem stenosis. They may have persistent or de novo incontinence. And then issues with mu mucus formation, stone formation, UTIs, and then, and then chronic bacteria. But the oleovesicostomy is a good option for patients that desire a non-continent diversion, especially in a patient with a very small capacity of bladder and, and it's non-compliant. So if you have a patient that has maybe had an indwelling catheter or SB2 for a long period of time, they probably have a bladder that's shrunk around that tube and it's very uh, poorly compliant, especially if a patient is not, is not obese. It's a good option. What you do is you just spatulate the bladder and then you, you uh, actually sew, you, you sew part of the intestine, you open it up and sew it to the bladder wall. And then you keep part of the intestine in tubular form, and that comes out as a urostomy. And the patient would just wear a bag, and they would just leak continuously. The nice thing is, you know, the patient is still connected from below, so you still have access from below. If, if you're doing it in a female and she has stress incontinence, you can do a autologous a pubovaginal, autologous fascial pubovaginal sling at the same time. You can also do a, a, a bladder augmentation. So if a patient is catheterizing from below, and, 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 the, and they, they need increased capacity, you can do a, a you know, take a piece of LAM and augment it. This is just a fluoroscopic picture of a bladder. This is a typical Christmas tree bladder that we see with neurogenic bladder. It's a real elongated bladder, and you can see these diverticuli that look like Christmas tree ornaments. And then after augmentation, we sew a patch of bowel on top of it. You can see this is the patient before the augmentation, really poor compliance, low, 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 uh, low volume, high pressure bladder after augmentation. You can see the shift, the curve shifted to the right, and that's improved. And then finally, patients that are really motivated, that, that desire having a continent diversion, and, and they really want to be able to catheterize from a seating position without having to transfer, you can do a, a continent diversion. And there's different options. The one that we use a lot is what we call Indiana augmentation cystoplasty, where you take part of the cecum, you, uh, you basically sew that onto the bladder for the augmentation, and then you taper the ileum and we use the, the uh, ileocecal valve as an anti-reflux mechanism that uh, patients uh, will prevent you know, urine from leaking from the pouch and they'll catheterize abdominally from the seating position. You, like I said, you still have access from below, so, you, so in emergency, you can still put a catheter from below if you need it. But let's, let's go to the uh, next slide. So here's a 35-year-old woman with T8 paraplegia. She underwent augmentation ileocystoplasty for urinary incontinence unresponsive to intermittent catheterization and amuscarinics. So she still has leakage uh, even on medicine post-op. So they put her on medicine. So we did urodynamics and this is what we see. And just so you can see this first line is the flow. This is measuring any urine flow. The next line is the detrusor pressure. The next line is the vesicle pressure. And then the last line is abdominal pressure. So vesicle pressure is a catheter in the bladder that measures the bladder pressure, abdominal pressure, is, is a catheter placed in the rectum. And detrusor pressure is vesicle minus abdominal pressure. So this is a calculated pressure. So based on this study, what would you uh, think, how would you treat this patient given these options? So some of these options are creating illovesicostomy, give her a continent catheterizable diversion, inserting additional bowel patch, placing a pubovaginal sling or closing the bladder, and doing an appendicovesicostomy. So let's see what you guys said on this. So it's a little mixed bag. So it looks like the most said pubovaginal sling, and then uh, it's really kind of all over the place. So. Let's kind of look at this study and see what we think here, and maybe that'll help. So what do we see here? So the patients are being filled, and, and you can see that there's a, the vesicle pressure uh, goes up. You see leakage occurring, but you see nothing abnormally, right? So that would be consistent with having an uh, overactive, uninhibited contraction with leakage, right? And then later on, you see this abdominal pressure. It looks like the patient probably had, probably had the patient Valsalva that's also uh, picked up on the vesicle pressure, right? But you don't see it on the detrusor because this is just an abdominal increase in abdominal pressure and there's no leakage occurring. So there's no stress leakage. It looks like overactivity. So I think, you know, because of that, the sling's not going to help. It looks like this bladder is still overactive. So 
you know, what would you what would be the appropriate treatment for a bladder that's still overactive after you do an augmentation? And in this case, we'll just go to the answer. It's going to say, you know, inserting an additional bowel patch. So that's an option to do that. Now, what I will say is that one option that wasn't on there is injection with Botox, and that would be my next step. If the medicine failed, the, the next stop would be injecting Botox into the, the usually it's the native bladder, and to see if that helps. If that still doesn't help, then in that case, you can you can insert another patch in. It may mean that, uh, that there's still some overactivity. You haven't broken that, that uh, contraction in the bladder enough. That's why it's really important to do a really wide spatulation before you do put your augment in, because if you leave the bladder in a contracted state, it can still you know, cause some of these overactivities. So this is a little tricky question, but uh, the urinems can help you know what's going on. So then we talked about uh, failure to store due to bladder. It can also be failure to store due to the outlet. So this would be just intrinsic sphincter de 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 deficiency. If a patient had an injury that affected the pudendal nerve, they had a denervation of the sphincter. Maybe they had a pelvic fracture and it caused a distraction injury. Whatever the case, maybe a patient had a sphincterotomy. They don't have any uh, outlet mechanism to control that leakage. And so in this case, really, you're going to use absorbent products. They can use a condom catheter if they can maintain it. And then it would be treatments for stress incontinence, whether that's injection therapy, artificial sling, a male sling, or in the case of a female, a pubovaginal sling. Here's another question. A 35-year-old man with C5 quadriplegia has urinary incontinence managed by condom catheter drainage. So urodynamics reveals a detrusor leak point pressure of 60 centimeters at 150 ml. So the next step is, and we'll bring up the answer. So you can do observation. You can put them on intermittent catheterization. You can give them anti-muscular medication. You can do external sphincterotomy, and or you could uh, do a sling in this patient. So what do we what do you think in this case? So we'll bring up the answer. So anti-muscarinic medications, and then intermittent catheterization. So this is kind of another tricky question. You got to look, the guy's C5 quadriplegia, so he probably doesn't have good hand function, right? Uh, and uh, so he's probably not going to be able to catheterize himself. He's got high leak point pressure, so observation is not good, right? The anti-muscarinic anti medication would help the bladder, but it wouldn't help him empty. A sling wouldn't help, help him in this case. So I think in this case, the best answer is going to be Let's click on that. Would be sphincterotomy. He's got high detrusor leak point pressure. He's got really a, a failure to empty, not a failure to, uh, failure to store. And so we have to do something that's going to help him empty. And because he can't really, you know, he probably doesn't catheterize since he's quadriplegic, that uh, he's either going to need some kind of chronic catheterization or a sphincterotomy. And so that kind of goes into this failure to empty category, which could be due to bladder function. Usually, if it's due to bladder, it's due to underactive bladder or to hypercontractility. And I'm not going to go through all this because of the sake of time, but all these slides will be available to you. But if it's an outlet issue, it could be due to detrusor sphincter dysenergia. So what are our options for that? Well, if the patient can catheterize, then you can bypass that sphincter and put them on intermittent catheterization and really relax the bladder and paralyze the bladder. But if they don't have that, then one option is doing a sphincterotomy. And it's important that before you do that on a patient that they can maintain a condom catheter because this is considered a, a permanent surgery. So this is an example of a failure to empty. This patient has detrusor sphincter dysenergia. This is a, <coughs> excuse me, fluoroscopic image of the bladder. And if you saw the urodynamic tracing, you'd see that they were having an overactive bladder contraction. The contrast comes through the proximal urethra, but it just stops right at the level of sphincter. If you saw the EMG tracing, you would see a lot of EMG activity. And this is what you see on fluoroscopy if you're going to video urodynamic study with uh, detrusive sphincter dysenergia. So you can do a sphincterotomy, and this is a patient that after sphincterotomy, this is the one treatment that actually changes the leak point pressure. The leak point pressure was elevated above 40. Now it's down to 12 centimeters. And this patient is just going to leak, uh, dribble at very low volumes. And uh, this is a, another slide uh, question. A 52-year-old man with erectile dysfunction undergoes video urodynamics for avoiding dysfunction. This is the image taking uh, early during filling. This is during the filling phase. There's no bladder contraction. And so what does this suggest the diagnosis of? We'll put the answers up. So it could be either bladder neck dysenergia, cervical stenosis, Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy, 
or multiple sclerosis. So remember, this is, a, the, this is during the filling phase. There's no bladder overactivity seen at all. And given this picture, what would you think is going on with this patient? Let's see what uh, you guys say here. All right, that's pretty good. So multi-system atrophy versus bladder neck dysenergia. So what do we see here during the filling? So we see that the bladder neck's open, right? So if this patient's never had surgery before, never had a TERP, you wouldn't expect if they have this open bladder neck during filling, then it mean, there must be some denervation occurring with the sympathetic system here causing this open bladder neck. If, they don't, if they're not having a bladder contraction. So dysenergia would be the opposite. So this would be doing a bladder contraction the bladder neck's not opening, it's not funneling open. Uh, and, and so we'll talk about these other issues. Shouldn't cause it, but multi-system atrophy is, is a cause of that, or side dragger syndrome. So that's a common finding. These patients usually will see open bladder neck at rest. They also can have other neurologic issues such as erectile dysfunction and uh, even some underactive detrusor. And that kind of leads us into talking about another neurogenic etiology, Parkinson's disease as well as multi-system atrophy. So this is a neurogenitive disorder affecting the dopaminergic neurons in a substantia nigra. With, with uh, Parkinson's disease, it's only the neurons, but with multi-system atrophy, it's also the glia is involved. So some think it's really more of a progression further along the spectrum of Parkinson's disease. But you can see voiding dysfunction at 45%. So these patients with Parkinson's often have neurogenic detrusor overactivity. They don't have true dysenergia because remember, there's not a lesion within the spinal cord, it's just within the brain, but they can have a condition called bradykinesia. They have bradykinesia of their skeletal muscles. They can also have it of the skeletal muscle in the sphincter where it, 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 it does impair relaxation. So it can almost look like a dysenergia where they have obstructive warding, but it's really uh, impaired relaxation more than uh, excessive contraction. Now, multi-system atrophy can mimic early Parkinson's disease, but it's more progressive. And this is characterized at least urologically by neurogenic detrusor underactivity, an open bladder neck like we saw in that urodynamic tracing, and also denervated sphincter. So these are the patients. In the past, they've always talked about, you know, watch, you know, don't do a TERP in a patient with Parkinson's disease, you know, because it may cause incontinence. It's really these patients with the multi-system atrophy, where they may already have a denervated sphincter, and you may compromise them worse. So it's important if you see someone with a Parkinson that has these other symptoms occurring, that may, maybe they have, have more than just Parkinson's, maybe they have multiple system atrophy. And then I think this is the, the final question. One month after L5 laminectomy, a 30-year-old woman develops lower extremity weakness or residual urine of 300 ml and intermittent urinary stream. A urodynamic, video urodynamic exam reveals detrusor sphincter dysenergia. So the most likely explanation in this case is, and we'll put the answers up, is it pseudodysenergia? Is it recurrent lumbar disc herniation? Is it called equinus syndrome? We saw that earlier. Is it undiagnosed multiple sclerosis? Or is it permanent nerve injury from a disc? So we'll kind of go through that and then uh, see what your answers are for this. Undiagnosed multiple sclerosis. So good. And you guys were right on that one. So. Because the main thing is just looking to see what, of all those cases, which one can cause the detrusive dys dysenergy. That's the only one that's going to cause it. Remember, it's got to be a lesion in the spinal cord, suprasacral, you know, below the pons of the suprasacral. Pseudodysenergia is, is basically dysenergia, but it's voluntary. So it's a patient that has urge, uh, urge incontinence, and you voluntarily contract your sphincter to prevent leakage from occurring. It's not it's not, it's not an a unconscious contraction, it's a conscious uh, trying to prevent from emptying. And then all these other things, disc herniation, called equina, and permanent nerve injury from disc, these are below the level of the cord, so they're below the uh, sacral cord that, uh, in called equina. They're not going to cause it. Uh, MS, you, know, you can't have plaques within the spinal cord, so you can't have dysenergy in these patients. And that kind of leads us to MS. This is our final topic, and then we'll answer some questions. So these are caused by demyelinating plaques that have the CNS. There's three types. There's the relapsing remitting. This is most common. Usually patients have symptoms present. Uh, they have this, uh, uh, and then they, with treatment, they partially or completely resolve. And they, some of these patients, about 50% of these patients can then go into what they call secondary progressive, where they, they, don't, they don't recover from, their, from their, uh, their exacerbations, and they have some you know, disability from that. And then a small percent 
have a primary progressive where they just have continuous neurologic degradation without really any exacerbations. They just start becoming disabled. Typical onset is between 20 and 50 years is more common in women. Remember, about two-thirds present with pre moderate to severe LUTs, and about 14% can present with urinary symptoms initially. So if you have a patient that has, you know, uh, that fits in this category, has pretty significant urinary symptoms, you may want to do some urodynamic testing, see if they have dysenergy, and get them referred for neurologic evaluation. The urodynamic studies usually show uh, neurogenic to true sort of activity in the majority of them. Dysenergy in about a quarter of patients and about a fifth of patients will have underactivity. About 10% will have normal studies. And treatment is, is really similar to a lot of the other ones. You want to, you know, evaluate patients initially, do behavioral therapy and pharmacologic therapy. If they have elevated PVRs, then you can consider starting on intermittent catheterization. If they fail that, you can do third-line therapies, botulinum toxin or neuromodulation. The one issue with the sacral neuromodulation is, if, is the restriction on MRIs. Uh, that, that may be lifted in the, in the near future, and then maybe you know, some of the new technologies out there that uh, allow you to do low-intensity MRIs. So that, that, that may be relaxed with time, but in the past, that was a big issue with these patients. And then if uh, that fails, some patients are so disabled, you end up putting a supercubic tube in, or other patients that are motivated, you can do a reconstructive surgery augmentation. So I think just to summarize, uh, the neurogenic bladder, remember, it's a dysfunction of the bladder resulting from the disease within a CNS or peripheral nerve to control micturition. You have to have an underlying neurologic etiology or at least one that's thought to be causing their symptoms. Urodynamics are real key, especially in the patients that are at risk for dangerous bladders, ones that are either uh, poorly compliant or have dysenergia. So these are the, definitely the patients that have the spinal cord injury or the MS. You want to get baseline urodynamic studies. And our goal in these patients are really, first goal is preserve renal function and then reduce complications and provide them uh, with an acceptable solution that improves the quality of life. So I appreciate your attendance, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that Carissa has. Dr. Smith, thank you for that excellent talk. We really covered a lot of ground, and I realized that you know neurogenic bladder is such a heterogeneous condition, um, and there's so many different um, you know, pathways to managing these different patients. So thank you for providing such a comprehensive overview. Um, and thank you everybody else who uh, submitted some questions for us. So I'm just gonna get started. Um, just as a quick reminder, please fill out the survey um, online. Oh and, yeah, I didn't show that right there. there we go. Oh yeah, the magical slide. So please fill out our survey. Um, any Q and A questions we don't get to, uh, we'll, we'll post onto the website as well. Um, so I'll get us started um, with this question about um, how you typically follow your uh, spinal cord injury patients or maybe patients with more um, congenital, you know, spinal conditions. Um, how often are you doing your dynamics, ultrasound, seeing the patient? Um, good question. That's a good question because there really aren't any, you know, clear or, uh, you know, well agreed upon guidelines for that. I think it, it differs. I think that for sure that patients that you think are, are higher risk, you definitely want to follow more closely. I think I always will do a, a, an annual or try attempt at least do an annual renal ultrasound to look at their upper tracts. And then as far as urodynamic testing, I think it's important that um, these patients that are that are high risk, the dysenergic patients, the poorly compliant, that you have to do routine follow-up at least, you know, try to on an annual basis. Or if you're doing some, you know, change in treatment, if you're going to have a patient with poor compliance and you give them Botox injections, you have to really repeat the urodynamics to see if you've improved their compliance. If, because symptomatically, they may feel the same. If you haven't improved their compliance, it means it's not working. Also, if there's a change in their in their function, if they start, you know, developing, you know, more incontinence or recurrent UTIs, maybe more dysreflexia, then that's another sign to, to maybe restudy them. Mm -hmm. I think ideally, it would be nice to, you know, do a urodynamics on patients every on an annual basis at least, and ultrasound, you know, every year. But I think what we try to do is at least do an ultrasound on a yearly basis. And, you know, on these high-risk patients, you know, try to get a urodynamics every year. And then, then other patients kind of follow them for changes in their upper tracts or in their clinical condition. Great. Um, and I know this could probably be another talk, but, you know, in terms of managing recurrent urinary tract infections in these patients, um, uh, when you're following them, what are some general principles or guidelines that you have for um, how, you know, if a patient's getting increased frequency of, re of UTIs or how you're, you know, instructing your ancillary staff to kind of work, um, work through those issues? Right. So I think it's, 
it's important to really know, you know, what's a UTI versus, uh, you know, bacteria. So we don't normally, you know, screen these patients, even check their urine, you know, unless they're symptomatic. So we only really, uh, would be, and what we call symptomatic UTI can vary, but in general, we look at patients that are having, you know, either, uh, you know, hematuria, uh, they're having worsening spasticity, worsening leakage, fevers, you know, in males, they may have epididymitis, you know, uh, worsening dysreflexia, some kind of clinical symptom that suggests, you know, true infection versus just my urine is cloudy, it smells bad, and then, you know, I need to get on antibiotics because then you're just going to overtreat and develop mm -hmm. resistance. So once, you know, once you diagnose this patient's having recurrent infections, then you want to find out, you know, what's occurring. Are they, you know, not catheterizing frequently enough so that their urine is colonized and is becoming stagnant? Are they catheterizing perhaps too often? You know, are they, are they causing trauma during catheterization? We often will use hydrophilic catheters. You can use self-contained catheters. Um, uh, if, you know, obviously if patients have chronic tubes indwelling, then you may have to change them more frequently. If, uh, you know, patients could also have, you know, bladder stones or renal stones that could be causing recurrent UTIs, you want to look at that as well. Male patients, if they get UTIs, they can often have, you know, a, a prostate infection. So you have to treat them for a longer period of time than a female. We'll do things like, uh, you know, probiotics, getting patients on, you know, cranberry supplements, and, you know, you know, women on, you know, the, the uh, if they're old enough, uh, the x-ray screen, we'll do those measures as well. Good bowel management's important as well. So there's different things to try to, to look at. Uh, those are some of the, the things we look at initially. Mm -hmm. And do you, how often do you actually use long-term antibiotic prophylaxis for these patients? Yeah, generally not. I can't say I don't have any. Generally, patients that, that are uh, catheterizing or have the indwelling twos, we, we don't normally do that because that usually will just breed resistance. But I can't say not. I mean, I do have some patients with chronic SP tubes that I have on low-dose prophylaxis because they just continually get infections and it, it seems to help. But in general, we, we try to avoid, we try to do all these other measures first to try to, um, to try to limit them. You know, if they have bladder open, out to be active and catheterizing without transfer, then the content diversion would, would help help that patient as well. You know, sometimes you have a patient that, if you have a bladder that's so, that the capacity is so small, so if it's like less than 150 or 100 mLs, that's going to be a tough bladder to really augment onto. So in that case, you know, if you're going to, you you know, if they're not motivated to have a content diversion, then it'll be a costume, a non-content diversion would be really useful. If you had a Really, if they really desired a diversion, you maybe would have to make a whole, you know, whole neobladder, you know, mm -hmm. like an Indiana, you know, um, neobladder that they would catheterize through. Yeah. So that, that's how the urodynamics can help you there. All right, perfect. Um, so it looks like we've reached our time. Um, sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but we'll make sure, you know, we'll make it, uh, they'll make it onto the website soon. Um, thank you again, Dr. Smith, for your time this morning and walking us through your management of these patients. Um, sure. So Remember to fill out your surveys. Um, I think we'll have these slides available for you guys that if you want to you know, review at a later time. Thank you so much. Yeah, the slides in the video will be posted on the website as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Smith. All right. One tomorrow. Bye -bye. All right. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.